So, several of you uh, have taken the liberty of sending me a few jokes. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, why you think I need that. I read through some of them, and uh, I have some for you. I think, I think we have a good thing going here with the puns, and so I think it's time, it's, it's time for a, a good grown Friday. About a month before he died, my uncle had his back covered in lard, and after that, he really went downhill fast. That might be the best one. So. You really shouldn't trust atoms. They make up everything. Come on, guys. Got to wake up. Most people are shocked when they find out how incompetent I am as an electrician. Come on. This takes a level of intelligence. This is high humor. You know, I can't believe I got fired from the calendar factory. All I did was take a day off. Rest in peace, boiled water. You will be missed. Only three of you got that. The rest of you are confused. My boss said he's going to fire the employee with the worst posture, and I have a hunch it might be me. <laughs> hey, thanks for explaining the word many to me. It means a lot. And you should never spell part backward because it's a trap. Come on, are you, what's wrong with you? This is fantastic. If you keep sending me jokes in the, in the email, I'm going to keep reading these to you. I was, I was, I was going to get a brain transplant, but then I changed my mind. Okay, all right, well, I, I'll stop now. Applause. There you go. <laughs> okay, I just want you to have something to look forward to when Brian comes back. Movie clip this morning comes from the great uh, cinematic uh, theological piece, The Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Captain Jack Sparrow was looking for Captain Barbosa and the cursed treasure. So we're going to watch this scene. Uh, I always, sometimes I think Brian's really reaching when he finds these, cl with these clips. Like, well, how are we going to connect that to the, the uh, but th he's, at one point in the clip you'll see, he says not everything, not all treasure is gold and silver. And I think there's a point to be made there. So let's watch this together. What code is Gibbs to keep to if the worst should happen? Pirate's code. Any man who falls behind is left behind. No heroes amongst thieves, eh? You know, for having such a bleak outlook on pirates, you're well on your way to becoming one. Sprung a man from jail. Commandeered a ship of the fleet. Sailed with a buccaneer crew out of Tortuga. And you're completely obsessed with treasure. That's not true. I'm not obsessed with treasure. Not all treasure is silver and gold, mate. Gentlemen, the time has come! Yeah! For ten years we've been tested and tried, and each man jack of you here has proved his metal a hundred times over, and a hundred times again! Suffered on him! Punished we were, the lavish, disproportionate to our crime. Here it is. Cursed treasure of Cortez himself. And every last piece that went astray, we have returned. Who among us has paid the blood sacrifice owed to the heathen gods? Yeah. And whose blood must yet be paid? Yeah. Begun by blood. Waste not. 
A couple observations about that movie. One is, why did pirates have such bad oral hygiene? <laughs> and <laughs> did you know, the pirates are always smelly and dirty. Uh, the second thing is, if you know the story at all, if you watch the silly mo- the series of movies, I don't know how many they made now, there's this, uh, this compass that Jack Sparrow has. When he set, makes that comment, he says, not all, not all treasure is silver and gold. Uh, of course, for uh, Will, his, the treasure is the woman, he, his, his love of his life. For the pirates, it's to get their, their life back because they're like half ghost people or whatever. But for Jack Sparrow, he's got this compass that when you hold it, it, po- it points not to true north, but to your heart's true desire. And that's this principle this morning, the treasure principle. What we treasure is where our heart really is, Jesus says. Let's read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. This is uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7. Jesus gave what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we think of it, it's not really a mountainside, it's a hillside off the Sea of Galilee. And his sermon, this is most likely kind of a best of collection of Jesus. There's probably some part of this that was a long discourse. Other parts are maybe a collection of his teachings given over time. And here he's talking about where our hearts are. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the outline here, I'm just going to give you the fill-ins, because some of you you will leave all stressed out for the weekend if I don't tell you what the fill-ins are. And then we're going to just go a different direction, okay? How's that sound? So if you want to know what they are, we're going to click through them real fast. Uh, There's two kinds of treasure. There are two kinds of eyes. That's the next one. And there are two masters. We're going to kind of take them in reverse order here. Two kinds of treasure, two kinds of eyes, and two masters. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. You're going to, you can't serve both God and money. Ma- mammon is the word often used there, the, uh, the Aramaic word. You can't do it. You can't serve God and money. Why would he say that if it wasn't something we try to do? He, he clearly felt it necessary to say you cannot serve both. You're going to have to choose. And even if you think you can, you're going to end up despising one and loving the other. Your, your heart's going to be aligned with one or the other. You can't, you can't be neutral when it comes to this, or you can't split it evenly. Why would he say that unless it was a very real battleground for us? And it doesn't matter if you're a person who, relatively speaking, has a lot or has, feels like you're living paycheck to paycheck. This is an issue for every one of us. The treasure principle. In fact, I, I'd say if you're, if, you came, if you're thinking, okay, this is the money talk, and you think it doesn't apply to you, that's evidence that it does. Verses 19 to 21 are about money, and verses 24 is about money. But what about 22 and 23? Did you catch this little weird kind of thing in the middle there? Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body, but if the eye is full of darkness. Like, what, it sounds like he's changing the subject. What is this business about the eyes and lamps and the body? He's not changing subjects. It's a, a very important principle here. Physically speaking, if your eye is full of light, if your eye is good, if it takes in light, processes the light uh, accurately, you'll see the world accurately and you'll move through life because you can see. But if your eye is quote unquote bad, full of darkness, even just biologically, right, you can't see and it will impede your ability to move through life. Spiritually speaking, the idea is your spiritual eyes. Paul says, prays in Ephesians that the eyes of our heart be enlightened in Ephesians 1.18. What does he mean? Our hearts don't have eyes. He's talking about spiritual sight. So spiritually speaking, Jesus is saying, if you see the world, if your eyes are good, the eye of your heart, your eyes spiritually are good, you see the world, your life, your possessions, and your place in the world the way God sees it. And you move through your life the way he wants you to. If your eye is bad... You don't see your life, your possessions in this world the way God wants you to, and you don't live and move through life the way he wants you to. He's making a very profound point, but it's easy to miss because of, I think we just glossed right past that. He's saying, I think, to put it this way, how you see or view your money, your possessions, your quote-unquote treasure, tells you a lot about how you see God. You want a good indication of your view of God? 
take an inventory of how you think about and view and use your resources. Not how good you can quote theology, how well you know the Bible, or how often you go to church. That's helpful. But one of the best indicators of where our hearts are when it comes to who God really is, is our treasure, our wealth, and our resources. In Luke 12, uh, verse 15, Jesus uh, tells the parable of, of the rich fool. And in that context of that parable, he says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. It's an interesting phrase. Did you know there's kinds? Greed. No, nobody thinks they're greedy. I, I, I've, I've heard other pastors say this, and it's true for me. I've had lots of people come into my office over the years and talk about all kinds of issues in their life. I've had people come and confess all kinds of sin. I've had people come in and say, I think my brother-in-law has issues with greed. Or I think my wife has issues with greed. I've never had somebody come in and say, Pastor, I'm really, really greedy. <laughs> it's never happened. Because almost nobody sees that as their issue. Jesus says, beyond your guard against all kinds of greed. What kinds are there? Well, there's the kind that you don't see, that you're blind to. There's the kind that makes you compare constantly with other people, other men you work with, other men you interact with, other families. Once had a man tell me who's very generous to, to the to work of God in, both in the church and outside the church, and he said, he one time told me, your job is to tell me I'm not crazy. I said, what do you mean? He said, my ex-wife thinks I'm crazy. My business partners think I'm crazy. My accountant thinks I'm crazy for giving all this money away. So you just got to tell me a story about somebody's life getting changed to remind me that I'm not crazy. The kind of greed that makes you think you're crazy because you're, you're, it's not the way the world operates. The kind that produces fear and anxiety. The kind that lies to you and tells you that this is the good life is over here. The kind that robs your joy of giving and seeing God use your resources. We live in the wealthiest society in history. Over 70% of the world's wealth is in the hands of less than 5% of the world's population. Right here in the U.S. You could go to a, a website called globalrichlist.com. You could do it right now if you wanted to. If you get bored of this little message. And you could type in, your round, you could type in round numbers your, uh, your net worth. Or your, you could choose net worth or income. And it will give you a ranking in the, uh, uh, in the world, where you are, where you rank in the world, roughly speaking. I did this, and I am in the t uh, 0.07% richest people in the world. I'm the 4.3 millionth richest person on earth out of 7 billion. wonder where you rank. Think about that for a minute. We, th we, we live in a culture where we think, well... If I could just get to here, if I could get to here, if I could get, if I could get this settled, if I could get this paid off, if I could get this sold, if I could get to this stage in my career. And we're looking around and seeing this person, and, and we're, we're, we have the wrong measurements. These, uh, I want to ask this question then. Jesus is talking to us about where our treasure is. So I want to talk to you about this principle, the treasure principle. To treasure something means to desire it to the point you invest in it greatly because you feel you cannot do without it. It means to pursue it. You have to have it because it, give, it gives you a sense of worth and significance and value. In the great movie uh, Rocky, the first Rocky, they, they got worse from there. Rocky III was pretty good. Like we had a glimmer of hope, but they got weirder after that. But I still watch them because I'm committed now. Anyway, in, in, in Rocky, the first Rocky, there's the scene when, he's, when Adrian's at his, at his house, you know, at, for the at little well, house, his little ramshackle apartment, and she's asking him why he feels he has to go up against Apollo Creed. And, and it's this great scene. And, and he says, I don't even want to win. Oh, I don't even want to win, he says, you know. <laughs> I just want to be standing when the, when the final bell goes off. I want to be standing. Because if I'm standing when the final bell goes off, he says, for the first time in my life, I'll know I'm not a bum. Like his point is, if I could just make it to the bell, I'll know that I'm not a bum. I think about that spiritually speaking. Every one of us has got something in our life that we're sort of holding on to to know. If I could just, if I would know that I'm okay, that I matter, that I'm significant, that I'm not a bum, that I, my life has value. If I could just, and for many people in our culture, they attach that to wealth, possessions, achievement. So that's, I, that gets at what treasure is. What's treasure? It's that thing in your heart that makes you feel like, okay, I, I matter. I'm not a, your kid's success, your career success, whatever it is. It's the thing you pursue, the thing you can't do without, the thing that you sacrifice for. You invest in it greatly. Jesus says, where is your treasure? What are you treasuring? 
How do you know? How do you know, really? Well, one way to know what your treasure is is what are you willing to sacrifice for? What are you sacrificing for? You want to take an inventory of where your time and money really goes? That will give you a pretty good indication of this is, I'm treasuring this. This really matters to me. His whole point, I think, is that, that, that greed or your eye, it has the power to keep you from asking the questions that matter most. So one of the things is, I, 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 and again, I hope you don't hear this. We're not taking an offering this morning. This is not a plea for, for giving to the church. But one of the ways to know what I'm treasuring is to know where, where I'm giving toward, what I'm, where am I being generous toward. And then, then to want to know, like, well, where's, how, how do you know how much is treasuring? What's the number? How do, I, how do I know what the number is? Then I would know that I'm treasuring this and that it's okay. Well, I think that's the, even that's the wrong question. Do you, do you ask that question about the things that matter most in your heart? If you'd like to know what the number is, I'll tell you. Would you like to know? Who would like to know? Some of you are like, no, don't tell me. I don't want to know, right? I know the answer. Yeah. Do you know? Tell us, Jim. More. More. He's right. It is. Because as soon as you say, this is the line at which I draw, and I know on this side of the line, I'm fine. But on this side, I'm not. You're, you're right, you're, you're, you're setting a limit. So when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be, the reverse of saying that is, your heart is what you're treasuring. Most of you have heard about or know about the Old Testament principle of the tithe. That was literally making a tenth, or a, a, meaning a tenth, a ten, a ten percent gift. And the New Testament never mentions the tithe. We need to Paul's teaching and Jesus' teaching. It doesn't say that. And that's true. I think the tithe was an Old Testament law given to God's people to give a tenth of their first fruits, their crops, their, and herds to the work of God, the tabernacle, then the temple. And the New Testament doesn't stamp that as a law. I think it assumes it, but it doesn't stamp it. Do you know what the average church-going American gives today? To a chari- not just the church, but to charitable work at all? 2.5%. So, and we're, we're, we're average as a church family. And I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm just saying, let's, let's, take, let's just draw that out for a minute. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you're not saved by the law, by keeping the law, by doing all the right things. You're saved by the free gift of God's grace, which you don't deserve and could never earn. He, he lavishes that on you to forgive your sin and bring you into his family. If the, if, if the gospel is grace, then shouldn't grace, would grace make us more or less generous than the law required? It ought to make us more. This is what he's getting at when he says treasure. This is what grace is supposed to do in us. Jesus doesn't relax the law. He applies it to our hearts. It's what Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Grace that costs us nothing. Does the radical generosity of God and the amazing grace of Jesus make us less willing to give to God's kingdom or more? And how do we know what we're treasuring? That's the functional principle here. Here's how it works. What your treasure, your heart treasures, you will invest your money in. And what you invest your money in, you will treasure. So if your money is going to your kid's college, your personal retirement, your leisure, a, a, a new house, then that's what your heart treasures. That's what begins to fill your mind and, and you pursue. Well, how do you treasure Jesus? How do you treasure his kingdom? Think about this for a minute. How many of you have been, how many of you are financial planners? That's, that's your career. Okay, good. And don't take this the wrong way. I think you're, I have financial planners in my life and we love what you do, right? Those of you who have been to those guys that are financial planners, what are the questions they ask you when you sit down for the first time to do a financial plan for your family? Goals. Exactly right. Goals. Those are good questions. They ask you, what matters to you? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have when you retire? Where do you hope to be? Let's, let's, set the, let's set the picture of where you're headed, what your, go, what your goals are, and then we can back up and talk about how much you need to save, how much you need to invest, what kind of investments. We can put a plan together to get you there. But they ask you about your goals. They ask you really about what matters to you, right? What kind of life do you want to live? What, what, what kind of things are, are, do you care about? And what are they asking? Where's your treasure? So then we can put a plan together to talk about where your money goes so that you can really treasure those things. Well, if we're supposed to treasure God and his kingdom, 
Think about this for a minute. Just, we're not owners. We're money managers. We're God's money managers. And so let's think about that and what should we be doing if we're financial planners for God in a sense, managers of his resources. We should be asking God those questions. What matters to you, God? What do you care about, God? What's most important to you, God? <laughs> then I could ta- think about, okay, what you've given me, where should I be putting it, God? How much should I be putting here and here? How much of your resources should I be investing in my family and the work of your kingdom? We should be asking those questions. Most of us don't. I don't often enough. Because the psalmist tells us in, in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. In Leviticus 25, the land is mine and you are but tenants in it. In the Old Testament, minor prophet Haggai, the silver is mine and all the gold is mine. Maybe you're thinking, well, that's fine. He can have all that stuff, but I own my life. Uh Uh-uh, not so fast. 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. (laughs) He owns it all. And in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, Paul says, now it's required that those who have been given a trust should prove faithful. (coughs) So are we asking the owner, God, what he wants us, the managers or stewards, to do with his resources. Think about this for a minute. Men, do you want a greater knowledge, love, and experience of God in your life? You can answer out loud. <laughs> Anybody say, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Right? I do. I do. Do you want to know more about God's heart? Do you want to experience him more in your life? Do you want your heart and direction of where you're headed to be more aligned with his purposes? Do you want to care more about the things of God? I do. And if that's true for you, if you do, I I don't think we make this connection. But Jesus is saying there's there's a very clear way to do that. There's a very sure way to align your heart with God. It's not to sit in your room more and think spiritual thoughts. It's to place your treasure invested in his kingdom. Don't you, how many, where your money is, you think about that stuff, right? Why do you check the stocks? Why do you watch the markets? Why do you check your 401k? Because that's where your wealth and treasure is, and you care about that. You pay attention to it. You worry about it. You want, you, right? Well, you start investing in things that God cares about. Your heart will go there. He's giving you a very specific, clear principle. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It inevitably follows. If it's true, if we really do say yes to that, then that's, I think he's telling us exactly what to do. I want more of God in my life? Pray more? Absolutely. Study the Bible more? Absolutely. Fellowship more with other men? Absolutely. Serve? 100%. But one part of the formula I think we often miss is invest. Invest in what he's doing. And again, this is not, I'm not trying to guilt anybody to give in here. I'm saying invest in the work of God in the world. Give your resources. Your heart will follow. That's what he's saying to us. One of the great, I think, traps that I fall into, and I think we see in our, I see in our culture, is that we we believe we can hive that off, right? Slice that and put it over here, like we could. uh, That it's a different thing. Responsibility, stewardship, care for my family, a business plan. You know, I, I, I that's over here. But my heart, my my spiritual life is over here. I think what Jesus is profoundly saying here is. That you can't, that's, you're kidding yourself. You cannot serve two masters. You can't say over here and over here. You're going you're gonna to in, inevitably choose. And to ignore that fact is, to, is, is spiritually damaging to us. So I hope you see how you think about your money, your resources, your treasure, tells you a lot about how you think about God. In fact, there's, I've said this many times before, but there's really... Three litmus tests for somebody whose heart really is surrendered to, to, to the Lord. In the, in, and they come up over and over and over again in the New Testament in different ways. One is, can you forgive those who wrong you? Can you forgive those who wrong you? Regardless of their response, can you release your, your anger and hold and unforgiveness? If not, then maybe you really haven't experienced their grace and forgiveness God's given you. Number two, can you serve? Can you sacrifice your time and energy to serve those in need? And number three, are you generous? Can you invest your treasure? It's probably no better test. I mean, you can say all the right things, but do you want to know somebody's heart? Are they forgiving? Are they serving? And are they generous? And Jesus says to us right here, 
Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's temporary. It's, gonna, it's fading. It's fleeting. You can't hold on to it. And it's not going to be good for your heart. But invest in the kingdom. Your heart will follow. And it will pay eternal dividends. You've got some questions here for your tables. I'll give you a little break here where you can uh, process some of that stuff and then talk about the, your, these on your tables. What did you learn about money from your family growing up? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how much influence does money have on our day, on your day, excuse me, your day-to-day -day life? All right? I'll give you a little break here, and then you can talk around your tables, and we'll come back and pray at the end.